Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Paul and in this Rick to Com video, we're going to be discussing tech news which has popped up as usual over the past 24 or so hours. There are several rather interesting pieces today, including the fact that Intel are preparing multiple six core Coffee Lake processors for the desktop, AMD and their desire to release Threadripper with an included AIO cooler, which is very interesting. Speaking of AIO, we also are going to quickly take a look at a review of the Radeon Vega Frontier Edition 16GB liquid cooled version of the card. Now this one's very interesting to me because this particular card is vastly outperforming the Air version of the GPU and really does indicate that Vega needs pretty ample cooling, at least for the Frontier Edition. And I'd also like to say that I'm testing a new microphone as well. So this microphone is lapel mic. It sounds pretty good from my short tests. I've done several. So I'm going to be using it for this video because I want some feedback as well. So feel free to either comment on this video, message me on social media as well, uh, facebook.com slash redgamingtech. You can also email me paul at redgamingtech.com if you prefer. Uh, if you're not, for example, have a YouTube uh, account, because I know some of you don't, which is absolutely fine. So let me know what you think, think about the audio quality. Um, if it's still not quite where I want it to, I'll buy another mic as well. Uh, I also have a mic stand along with a pop shield for another mic. So we're just tr kind of trying stuff out. This is primarily for when I'm on camera, of course, not for regular videos. Anywho, let's begin. So starting out with Intel and the Coffee Lake range of processors. For those who don't know, I'm going to quick, quick we could give you a too long didn't read it is the successor to KB Lake although much of the CPU architecture is very similar there are a few noticeable changes perhaps for enthusiasts the most imperative of those important and exciting yes I realize that those three terms all mean very similar things at least in this context but still I digress good sir or good lady that is all of them will have six processor cores at least in the higher end SKUs at least that was the theory, because a newer report has just popped up from CPC Hardware, and this one's very interesting. Basically, it tells us that higher-end i7-8700Ks will run at 3.7 GHz base, and obviously it will have hyper-threading, means 12 cores total. Now, what's quite interesting about this is that the TDP of the chip is going to be 95 watts. This is pretty decent it is lower however than the 87 i'm um, sorry than the 7800x which has a tdp of 140 watts i also feel um that it's going to cannibalize much of the lower end i9 lineup i would actually say it would probably vastly affect the sales of their 7800 probably even the 7820 but that's just a theory on my part obviously we're going to have to wait to see how it performs but here's the kicker here's where it gets quite interesting the interesting part of the rumor for me is the fact that there will also be i5 processors in the series, of course, but they will actually have six cores as well. So the difference here is that they will lack hyper-threading only, but they will still have six physical cores. So the i5-8600K is going to be clocked at 3.6 gigahertz, so 100 megahertz less, but still features the same TDP, so 95 watts. That's very cool indeed, but there also is going to be a lower end SKU as well, SKU, depending how you wish to say it. Um, this slower six core processor is going to be referred to as the 8400. It's also an i5. It's clocked at 2.8 gigahertz with a TDP of just 65 watts. One can probably not have to venture too far into the fort realm to figure out that this is for the AMD Ryzen 5, at least to counter it. As you're probably aware, there are a lot of processors in the Ryzen lineup, and they range from four cores with no hyper-threading, or rather SMT. Uh, obviously, you have those with SMT, I know you're four cores, and you've got six cores, and then up to eight cores. This is not including the Threadripper lineup. So, obviously, AMD are putting a lot of pressure on Intel, they're definitely applying the thumb screws here. Also, Intel are looking to add a mobile version of this processor, which also has six cores. 
The clock, the clock speeds are more meager. It's running at around mm, 2 gigahertz ish And the TDP is also notably lower at only 45 watts. That's very cool. Now, personally, I have nothing against the introduction of these processors in terms of, you know, the, com the competition, I guess, with itself. And it really is. I mean, the Skylake X processors are essentially going to be getting a bit of a kicking, at least on the lower end. I've done quite a lot of extensive testing, as some of you may be aware, regarding Skylake X. I had the 7820X along with the 7900X, and I've done a lot of testing. I can't even describe how many benchmarks I saw with Tomb Raider and God knows what else. There was a lot, but I've got a lot of different results in a lot of different scenarios, and I think you're going to be very interested in the videos that are popping up, because not all of them are extending to reviews. Some of them are kind of testing scenarios. I'll let you see them when they uh, pop up over the next several days, but I can tell you that the 7820X is a rather nice processor. The problem is it doesn't really differentiate itself enough from Ryzen 7, so I do feel that Intel possibly should have just released the, the uh, 7900 and maybe a few other processors and maybe possibly re uh, reduce the price of the of the 7820X, that's just my opinion. Maybe you'll feel differently if you've used the processor or perhaps if you've seen different results. Well, that's down to you. Now, here's another interesting thing regarding AMD. This one is not exactly a big piece of news in terms of what to discuss, but it's a big piece of news in terms of value proposition. So as you're probably aware, AMD are preparing to release the Fredripper line of processors. Essentially, there are multiple SKUs with the higher end ones come clocking in at almost a thousand bucks, but they are very good in terms of value. And we've discussed those just a few days ago in terms of their performance, and they really do seem to be competing rather nicely with Skylake X. The 1920 has 12 cores, 24 threads, and it's going to cost you 800 US dollars. The 1950, 16 cores, 32 threads and is going to cost you a thousand US dollars. So no, they're not cheap, but they are going to be shipping in early August and they still offer a lot of performance. But here's the thing. They also are going to include a AIO, at least according to these rumors. That's fantastic. Obviously, there are a couple of questions with this. How good is the AIO? So for example, is it going to be able to compete with a really high-end Corsair or whatever cooler you may happen to have? And obviously, the second thing is that, well, it's not the greatest of savings, um, especially if you want to go with a, a fully dedicated water loop, then obviously you've got some problems there because it might be in included into the cost. So for example, let's say you want to go with a full dedicated water loop, excuse me, and therefore the AIO is about as much use to you as a paperweight because obviously you would rather have your dedicated water, water loop, God I can't seem to speak today, water loop over the AIO, and then obviously that would be bumping up the cost. However, perhaps if we're lucky, there's going to be certain models of this or perhaps OEM models of this which do not include the water loop. So either the 1000 bucks, for example, is going to be inclusive of the water loop or you have to pay the extra cost. I'm not sure which. While we await Vega to appear in its gaming form, with of course the RX Vega, there are still tests excuse me, being conducted with the Radeon Vega Frontier Edition. Now yes, I grant you that there will probably be some differences with the RX Vega. Specifically, I feel that there's going to be quite a large performance increase in terms of the drivers. I wouldn't be surprised if we see 10, 12, 15% perhaps with a later driver revision, although obviously we're going to have to just wait and see if this is uh, bore out with results or not. But the fact that the liquid cooler uh, version has now become on sale and people are now starting to test it, does give us some interesting insight into perhaps what we're going to see with RX Vega. Now I will link the article in the video description, but I do quickly want to go through a few results with you in this particular video. So, one of the reasons I find the water-cooled version, the AIO version of Vega more interesting um, than perhaps I originally gave it credit for was quite simply the fact that the clock speeds are much higher. To put it quite simply, it's much 
much, much closer to the 1600-ish megahertz that is rated for the peak operating frequency. And honestly, this is bore out rather nicely in terms of the results as well. I won't read out all of them because honestly, I'll be here for way too long. And as I said, I'll link the article in the video description, but I will pop up a few of the more interesting uh, results, at least in my opinion. Essentially, I think you can summarize this with the following. It is considerably faster than the air version. And by considerably faster, I mean 12 to 15, 17% in some cases. Now you may say to yourself, well, that's not considerably. That's not like, you know, 25 frames higher or anything like that. Yes, this is true, but it is considerable considering the only difference being that it's under AIO and the clocks are running higher. This does give us quite a lot of insight into the problems with Vega. And that is that, at the moment at least, it's a very power-hungry beast. In fact, there are some reports popping up which tells me that this card is really going to benefit, this architecture is really going to benefit from third-party coolers, from the custom parties, when you've got the MSIs and the Asus's and whomever else actually creating custom versions of the board, and perhaps even adding a third power connector to the board, and perhaps even being more aggressive or maybe even custom water versions of the card as well. So you can see various results, but essentially it boils down to the following. At least in PC PERS review, they now have it about even with the GTX 1080. And this is obviously considerably better than the previous results where it was just about managing to slightly beat a, a custom version of a GTX 1070. These results seem to bear themselves out with multiple different games, including The Witcher 3, Rise of the Tomb Raider, Hitman, Fallout, you get the idea. So there are a couple of things which really strike me here. One, um, I am very curious to see what the drivers do for RX Vega. In other words, what changes and tweaks they can make in, sh in terms of raw performance. I'm very curious to know what changes they can make in terms of the improvements to the actual efficiency of the card. We've talked about a rasterization before and how the cards just don't seem to be doing that effectively with Vega. So are there going to be some changes there? Uh, perhaps that's going to be enabled in the drivers. There are also some other reports as well that Vega is not being very power efficient. Basically, the, the synopsis is that it's not correctly clock gating and therefore even when the GPU is idle in momentary frames of animation or whatever, it's still not closing off parts of the GPU which aren't being used correctly. So it, it, it's just kind of curious to see whether some of that stuff is going to be fixed by RX Vega. And this, at least with the, the, um, the, uh, the water-cooled version, does show me that the GPU does have a lot of room left in the tank. So, as usual, we can only wait and see. But with all of that said, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.